Well, good morning, everyone. We're glad to have you here on this Lord's Day. It's a beautiful morning outside, a beautiful September day. We've been really blessed with still the temperatures being quite good for this time of year. So it's lovely to join together in this Lord's Day to praise and worship our great God together. Just before I commence with the service, I will make the announcements as normal at the end, but just a few little things that may be of encouragement to you. Our, our session uh, met, as you know, on Thursday night past. There have been some uh, changes which are in line with PCI guidance, and that is that the layout of the building is slightly different, thanks to, I think, Alan behind the scenes and Ivan Miller as well. Ivan, we appreciate what you've been doing uh, to enable us to move to, as the session agreed, 1.5 metres, which means we don't have to do two pews out of action, uh, and it reconfigures things and makes us feel a little bit closer together, and we do hope that that is uh, okay with everyone. The other thing is, just to say you'll uh, have followed the announcement last week about face coverings and face masks, and you'll know that uh, today we're unable to take those off once seated in the pew. Uh, some have already done that, and that's fine. Once you come in and get to your seat, you can do that now. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable taking your face covering off, there's no pressure on you. We're not going to be looking at you and saying, take it off. That's entirely your personal choice. Uh, the only requirement at the moment is that when we sing, we do wear our face coverings. But apart from that, we're able to keep them off during most of the service, and that will be a little bit easier and perhaps more comfortable uh, for most of us. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 146, where the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul, for he is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to Praise the Lord. And our first item of praise taken from IPH 227, the words on our screens, praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet our tribute brings. So IPH 227.
We come then to our opening prayer, so let's just pray together. Lord of hope and light, we pray that you would shine into our darkness and bring hope to our souls. Remind us again, we pray this morning, of the wonderful ways that you have cared for us when we were lost. Open our hearts to receive your loving spirit. Refresh our minds with knowledge of your everlasting power and your deep compassion. Lord, we know that in these times we are overwhelmed with fear and anxiety about living. We see trouble in many parts of our world. We see disunity and disagreement in our own government locally. And Lord God, of course, our ongoing fears concerning COVID-19. But when we feel discouraged and despondent, we pray that we would be reminded of your presence, that we would be reassured of your hand of comfort and strength upon us, your children, through faith and trust in your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. For you offer to us healing love, strength for our exhausted souls, courage to face whatever comes with the full confidence that you are with us at all times. So, Lord, forgive our weakness, forgive our little faith. Give us hearts, we pray, of strength and hope. Enable us to be among those who would reach out to others with welcome, healing, forgiveness, and love. For we ask all of this in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to read our scripture reading and then we'll we'll come to our children's talk. And this morning, we're also pleased to announce that the session uh, have approved the recommencement of our Sunday school once more. Uh, And all the the risk assessments have been done. All the mitigations by Mark and his team have been carefully put in place. So we know that they've made it as safe as they can for our children. And so we would encourage our boys and girls following the children's talk and the hymn of praise that they'll be able to move out uh, to join the Sunday school. But don't worry, uh, I'll announce that after the talk again. But we're going to come now at this stage to read from John's Gospel, chapter 21. So John chapter 21, beginning to read at verse 15. So John chapter 21, beginning at verse 15. And let us hear God's word. We're going to read through to verse 17. This is entitled, Jesus Reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And we thank God for his word. And then we're going to move to our second reading. So uh, two readings today. And the second uh, is actually from 1 John, 1 John chapter 4 beginning at verse 7. So 1 John chapter 4, and we're reading from verses 7 to 19. And sorry for the the very quick notice there to the guys at the back. You're doing tremendously well, so thank you. So 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. 
This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Amen. And we thank God for the second reading from his own word of truth. I'm going to speak to our, our boys and girls this morning. And I want to begin by asking you a question. And the question is this. If after I left the church service today and I was going along the road, imagine the police came in behind my car. So you've got to use your imagination because that would never happen. But imagine the police came in behind the minister's car and they decided, I think we'll pull this guy over and we'll check that he's the rightful owner of that car and we'll check that everything is above board and above the law. Let's say they wanted to do a check and make sure everything was right and in order. Well, they would maybe put their lights on, maybe put their siren on and then as the minister being very lawful, I would pull into the side of the road and I would wait patiently for the policeman or policewoman to come uh, to the car window. And then they would say, sir, do you own this vehicle? And I would say, my wife does. No, sorry, I would say, yes, I do. Uh, and then they would say, so, uh, and what's your address? And I would give them my address. They would want to be able to prove that I was exactly who I said I was. That I am Jonathan Sloan, that I live at 82 Portnone Road, Randallstown and that I am the owner of the car that I'm driving. So how would they check there and then that I was telling the truth? What might they ask for to make sure that I was telling the truth? What else? Now, I know they would look at me and say, well, he's obviously a minister. Of course, he's going to tell the truth. But if they wanted to make doubly sure that I was going to tell the truth, what might they ask for? Any ideas? Any suggestions? Yep, okay. Well done. Yeah, exactly. They would ask me to get out my wallet. And that would be a big thing for me to get my wallet out, okay? So I've got my wallet out, and then they would say, let me see your driver's license. So I'd have to go, actually, I'd have to go through a lot of cards in here to get to the driver's license, water stones, and all kinds of things. And then I would pull out this, and here would be the driver's license. Thank goodness you can't see it up close. And I'm awful glad that Jeremy didn't zoom right in to see the terrible photograph. But there is a photograph that matches me. And I can say to them, look, that's me. Jonathan Sloan, there's my name, there's my address. And they can say, thank you, sir. Everything is checked out. Everything's above board. You can now go on your way again. And I would be relieved. So I had the little bit of identification that I needed to prove I was telling the truth. You know, boys and girls, I was thinking this morning, how do we prove to others that we love Jesus and that we really belong to him? If we say that we've asked Jesus into our hearts and lives, that we have asked him to be our saviour and to be our friend, to forgive us of all of our sin, then we say that we're Christians. And if we are Christians, how do we show others? How do we prove to others that that's true? Any ideas what might prove to others that we definitely are Christians? Any suggestions? What would they need to expect from us? If we say that we love Jesus, what would they look for to back up that claim. Any ideas? Any suggestions? Even adults? No, not sure. What about how we love and treat others? Would that be something they might look for? Yeah, you agree? Yeah, and that's something that really struck me in preparing for today's service because here's a verse from God's word. It's always good to go to God's word to back up what we're saying. But John chapter 13, verse 35, and we have these words of Jesus recorded for us where Jesus says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So how do others know that we belong to Jesus? 
if we actually love one another. So we've got to love others. And one of the ways that we can love others is in being generous to others and looking out for the needs of others. And we're thinking very much about Operation Christmas Child and the shoebox appeal. And we're going to be bringing those boxes to church for the Harvest Sunday, the third Sunday of October. I'm going to mention later in the announcements the details about coming along to the church hall to get uh, what you need for your shoebox. But this morning in our service, to help us think about what it means to love others, to prove that we really belong to Jesus, we're going to look at a little video on the screen. Now, in this video, you will see the joy and the happiness on the faces of the children in many needy parts of the world who otherwise wouldn't get any Christmas presents, but because we and others have given to the shoebox appeal, they get a present at Christmas. So just watch the screens and watch especially how happy the boys and girls are when they get their Christmas present. The children are completely overjoyed. It's a real celebration. So many smiles on their faces. Smiles are all over. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. That's what this is all about. Operation Christmas Child is about expressing the love of God. It's its wonderful way to enter into the Christmas spirit in its true meaning. Operation Christmas Child has grown hugely over 30 years since it started here in Britain, but now it is a worldwide project to send millions of shoeboxes all over the world. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. So the shoebox journey essentially starts from people in their home packing shoeboxes full of essential items like a toothbrush, some school supplies. Toys and gifts, hygiene items, so there's a real mix. I love choosing the things to go in a shoebox. I like to think about what a child would enjoy receiving. Father, we commit these boxes to you as they start their journey. It's so encouraging having people coming into the church bringing their boxes. All sorts of people can help with Operation Christmas Child. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. The volunteers lovingly check and prepare shoe boxes for international shipping. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world. And that is only the beginning. So when the children have got their boxes, they are invited to take part in something called The Greatest Journey. Which is a 12-lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes The Greatest Journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, it makes everything new. Operation Christmas Child opens doors for people to discover what is the greatest gift of all, the love of God through Jesus. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. I really encourage you to pack a shoebox and get involved with Operation Christmas Child. Lives are being changed all over the world. It's brilliant. So hopefully that gives us some idea of just the sheer joy and the happiness that our boxes bring when we send them on to boys and girls in some very needy parts of the world. So I'm just going to encourage our boys and girls to think about what it means to be a Christian. Yes, we ask Jesus to be a part of our, to be a part of our lives. We ask him to be our friend, but we show that in our love and our concern 
and our help for others. We're just going to pray with our boys and girls. Then we're going to move into our next praise, Take My Life and Let It Be. And during that praise, we'll allow Mark uh, to lead those who wish to leave for our Sunday school uh, through to that. So let's just pray. Lord, we do pray for the boys and girls of our church family. We thank you for some who are here today, others who will be listening in online. We pray you'll keep them safe along with their parents and families in these days. We do pray that you'll help us to show that we love you in the way that we love others. And we pray for our Sunday school as they meet for the first time today in our church hall. Keep everyone safe. May it be a wonderful time of encouragement to Mark as our main leader in Sunday school and to those who will serve alongside him because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry. I, the Lord of sea and sky, you're quite right. I don't know why. I think I had, that was another possibility and I cancelled that one out. Sorry to give you that, that uh, very uh, worrying moment or two there. But it's I, the Lord of sea and sky is the hymn that will appear on our screens. And during this, our children can leave for their uh, Sunday school. Apologies, Ray. <laughs>
going to come to your prayers for others. Sorry to, to pounce upon this good man, Tommy. I wonder, would you mind just opening the door at the side just for a little bit of airflow, if that's okay? Just one of the doors for ventilation, if that's all right, Tommy. That's great. Even just that little bit is brilliant. Thank you. We're going to come then to our prayers for others. Let's just pray together. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the way that you have helped families, children, and young people through the pandemic. We pray that they would continue to reintegrate into worshiping life as a degree of greater normality returns. Today, we thank you for the beginning once more of our Sunday school and pray your blessing upon Mark and those who serve alongside him. We think of some of our church organizations who will be planning over the next weeks to return to their events and activities and ask your blessing upon all of the plans that they would make in your will. Lord, we're aware that BBC Radio 4 will broadcast a special service with the moderator and involving musicians from the new Irish orchestra today. We want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that our churches are given to broadcast in this way. And we pray that this service will be a blessing to a great many people. As we pray for the country of Afghanistan again, we simply ask that for those evacuated or still trying to flee, that they would find refuge and be guided in their next steps. We pray that Christians will be strengthened in their witness and for all minorities to be protected. Lord, we pray that as some of our church organizations recommence again, that you would keep our leaders, our children, our young people, our church members safe. But we thank you that the recommencement of some events will be such an encouragement to many. We pray today for all medical, nursing, and social care staff as they continue to work through the obvious challenges of the pandemic in our hospitals at the moment. We pray for our community of Randallstown in particular. We know, Lord, that things have been especially difficult in our area. And we pray for those who are ill, that you would draw near and minister by your grace. We pray for all from our church family who are unwell in hospital, at home or in nursing homes, and those who will face procedures this week, may they know your gracious and healing touch to be upon them. Lord, hear all these our prayers, which we offer now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, recently I came across the following story in an article I read entitled The Heart of of Christianity is love. And let me share the story with you. It's just a, a short snippet from it. The writer says, Mike Bryan was an agnostic journalist who decided to write about the mindset of evangelical Christianity. As part of his research, he enrolled himself in a Christian Bible college. In his book, Chapter and Verse, Bryan described a bus trip that he took with fellow students to a Bible conference. During the trip back, student after student walked to the front of the bus, took the microphone, and said something encouraging about the experience. One young lady began to weep as she shared her heartfelt concern for Brian's salvation. And at that moment, Brian realized that this girl, who hardly knew him, yet demonstrated genuine compassion and love for him, was expressing the very heart of the Christian faith. Isn't that wonderful? Love being demonstrated by those who say that they love the Lord. You see, the heart of Christianity is surely love. The whole basis for our Christian faith is God's love for you and for me. In John chapter 3 and 16, we read that well-known verse that we surely know from our, our days in Sunday school, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. God loves us, not because of anything that we have done or anything that we could give to him. 
Instead, the Bible tells us that God desires a relationship with you and with me. Why? Well, because, as we're told in Ephesians 2 and verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us. You see, the reality is when you and I receive God's love through faith and trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's only natural that we, just like the Bible college student on that bus, will show that love, that compassion, that concern to others. We talked about this last week. We talked about loving one another within the body of Christ. And we read earlier from 1 John chapter 4, and in verse 19 we read, we love, why? Because he first loved us. The fact is a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ will demonstrate an authentic, a heartfelt, a real love for others. When our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ began laying the foundation for the church, he began with three very simple questions. And we find these three questions at the close of John's gospel, where we hear Jesus saying to Peter so very simply, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. In the next verse, we read of how Jesus yet again for a second time asks him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter answers a second time, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says to him, take care of my sheep. And then for a third and final time, Jesus asks Simon, son of John, do you love me? You can imagine that Peter was getting a little bit exasperated at this point, maybe a little bit hurt and annoyed. And he responds, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus again says, then feed my sheep. Love, it lies at the very heart of the Christian faith. Peter is told that an expression of his love for his Lord is that he might have tender concern for the lambs and for the sheep. Whether it be the transforming love of our heavenly father, the reciprocating love of neighbor through Christ, or the simple joyous love that we experience as believers in the presence of the spirit, love is crucial to our Christian faith. And our Lord's questions to Peter remind us all here today that if we profess faith in Christ, then we're asked time and time again to prove our love for God, not just in word, not just with a mere profession of our lips, but also in our deeds, in our actions. It's not just at the conclusion of John's gospel that we find this important teaching of love being at the very heart of our Christian faith. We find it also in the epistle which we read from this morning from 1 John where the central theme is God is love. In the gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke, we find the instruction being quoted from the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In John's gospel chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, we read, just as I have loved you, so you also ought to love one another. So placing love as crucial, placing love at the center is crucial to our faith. We're told in God's word again and again that we're called, we're set apart, we're commissioned by Christ as Christians to be disciples of love. We're to practice our faith, we're to live out our faith by living as compassionate and caring servants to others. Because we have received the mercy and the grace of God, in turn, we seek to offer it to those around about us. As we see at the close of John's gospel, when we say to our Savior, yes, Lord, you know that we love you, we then immediately receive his divine commission, go and feed my sheep. Prove your love by what you do for others. 
One writer says, from our union with God made possible because of the obedient life, death, and resurrection of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and our faith and trust in him as our Savior flows our love and our compassion for others. And that's the point that John is keen to drive home, not just in his gospel, but also in his letter, which we read from earlier. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 19. And the context is that John wrote those words, his first epistle, to the struggling Christian community in Ephesus at the very end of the first century. And there, disagreements had broken out over the theology of Christ's person and his nature. There were all kinds of of theological positions being taken. And John writes in this context to tell this Ephesian community Dear friends, look, you've got to love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. John makes it abundantly clear in the words that he writes, but also in his example, in his ministry of outreach and caring, that the body of Christ has been given this new commandment. And we find it in John's Gospel, chapter 13 at verse 34. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. Now, let's be really honest. Just like the members of the the early church back in Ephesus, the close of the first century, we here in the OC Church in Randallstown, part of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, we have our own struggles, our own problems, our own difficulties, because we're not a perfect church. There, are, there is no perfect church here on earth. You, you know the old adage, if you find the perfect church, don't join it. Why? Because you'll only ruin it. There are no perfect congregations, because we're made up of fallible human beings with our own weaknesses. And just like the people of Ephesus, we find ourselves being confronted today by the fact that it is through God's love that we are transformed by his grace. And it is this grace that we need to share and pass on to others. So let's ask ourselves, we who make up the body of Christ, we who make up the church, Christ's bride, we who know and love the Lord, let's be prepared to ask What do people in this community know us for? When they look in at us, do they know us by our sincere and genuine love for Christ our Lord? And do they also note and see at work our love, our compassion for one another? Let's go back to 1 John chapter 4 verses 8 to 10 where we read earlier, Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In these verses, love is defined for us. This is love, we read, Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's greatest demonstration of his love, his compassion, his concern for you and I was the sending of his one and only son to be our redeemer. Sending his one and only son to be the sacrifice at the cross of Calvary, who paid in full the penalty that we deserve for our sin, thereby making peace between us and God. And that's so amazing, isn't it? It really thrills our hearts and our souls today that God lavished upon us a love that was unmerited, a love that was undeserved, a love that could never be earned. And even when we feel, because we do, Because as I said, we're fallible human beings. Even when we fail and mess up, our God is still faithful. And he doesn't let go of us. 
You see, God's word tells us that God's love is kind, patient, generous, merciful, unfailing, and unending. And in that famous Bible passage about God's love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're told that God's love does not keep any record of wrongs. It detests evil. It does not envy or boast. In fact, we could say God's word is littered. It's jam-packed with verses about God's love. And the stories and accounts of the scriptures demonstrate to us the power of God's love. Once you and I have grasped the depth of God's love for us, once we've accepted his love by responding to God's call upon our hearts and lives by turning from our sin and trusting in Jesus, then we'll automatically want to love others as God has loved us. We do well to pray today the words of the hymn writer, help us help each other, Lord, each other's load to bear, that all may live in true accord our joys and pains to share. Help us to build each other up, your strength within us prove, increase our faith, confirm our hope, and fill us with your love. It's so easy, isn't it, to say that we love the Lord with our lips. But that profession of faith needs to be backed up by our actions. Because whether we like it or not, people pick up on our actions. How we behave, how we treat others, how we get along with others. And from that, they decide who we really are. If our actions imitate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then people will say, surely these people love the Lord Jesus. The one who demonstrated the greatest love for us by giving his life for us on the cross of Calvary says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Before and after his death at Calvary, Jesus commands us to show the same kind of love toward one another. Read in John chapter 13 and verse 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, how if you love one another. Loving one another is something that we who know and love the Lord ought to strive to do. For God commands us in his word to love our neighbor, to love our brothers and sisters in the Lord and the household of faith to love others. Even when others maybe don't love us in return. And it seems a pretty tall order, doesn't it? And to be sure, we fall short. But the good news today is that God does not leave us on our own to show this love to others. Because I know that that's perhaps the question in your mind. How am I going to do this? How am I going to achieve this? I meant to love others, brothers and sisters in the Lord, neighbors, even those who do not love me in return. How am I supposed to do this stuff? Well, the good news is that God says you're not on your own. For we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Did you get that? The spirit who lives in you. That's the answer. The heavenly father has given us a helper, the Holy Spirit. And as believers, as Christians, the Holy Spirit lives, dwells within our hearts and lives. And it is the aid and help of the Holy Spirit that will enable us to show the love of Christ in action. We won't be able to do it on our own. We simply cannot manufacture that kind of love for others in our own strength or our own ability. But because the Spirit is within us, it's the Spirit who helps us live out the Christian life. So today, we receive a fresh Christ's great command that as we are loved by God, so we must also love one another for God is love and to be Christian is to be loving kind patient generous considerate and forgiving we looked at Operation Christmas Child in the shoebox appeal with our boys and girls it's only one small way that we can show 
that we love the Lord as we show love to those in great need in our world. And as we begin a new church year with some encouraging signs, some small steps towards organizations and events beginning again, we do well to remember that all that we do in our times of worship, in our church events, activities, organizations, in our efforts of outreach and witness in our community, all of it must be done in love, must be covered in love. I close with these words of one writer who states, the church is not a creed, it's not a code, it's not even a physical construction. It is the men and women in front of you, beside you, behind you. For the church is the body of people gathering by the grace of God to know and to share the love of Christ. In the words of Wren Collective's contemporary song, and I don't know if you've ever heard this song of praise, some will, we have these lyrics. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here, we pray. And let us pray. Lord God, we think of those words of that praise song. We are your church. The church is not the building. It is the people who profess to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we who would profess faith in Christ have experienced God our Father's deep love. A love that we could never have deserved. A love that is so abundant. And as we have received that love, you then ask us to pour out that love and to show it in action to others. Lord God, help us to be a loving people, a compassionate people. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Yes, Lord, we pray, set your church on fire. Win this nation back. We live in a land where the things of God have been pushed to the one side. We long that you might revive us. We long that you might win our nation back to your standards and ways and to your word. That can happen when the atmosphere is changed. When we, the church, truly become a loving and caring people. Lord, build your kingdom here, we pray. Amen. We're going to come then to our, our final item of praise uh, the words appearing on our screen, the words reminding us that the church is wherever God's people are praising, reminding us that the church is not the building, as we've said, not the bricks or the mortar, but the church is wherever God's people are praising. We're praising him here in the O.C. in Randallstown in Northern Ireland. At the same time, there are people all over the world who are praising the Lord. And at different times throughout this Lord's day, right across the world, people will be praising his name, some of them openly and in public like this, but it has to be said, some in secret, for fear of their lives, in places like Afghanistan. We think of them too as we sing, the church is wherever God's people are praising.
Let's just be seated as we, we come to a few announcements. We want to remind you that the lower church hall will be opened on Saturday the 25th of September from 10 a.m. through to 12 noon to allow the ladies from our helping hands to collect wool and to leave craft and also for anyone who wishes to collect items for their shoebox for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, the FWO uh, money drop will also be on the same occasion, uh, Saturday the 25th of September. That will be from 10 through to 11 a.m. in the church hall. And uh, we remind you also of that. Following our recent Kirk Session decision, the distancing, as I mentioned in church, is now set at 1.5 metres, and, and that makes a difference to the number of people that we can perhaps bring in uh, to the church building. And uh, we've already mentioned the fact that uh, we are enabled now to take our masks off for the majority of the service, and that makes things that little bit more comfortable for us. Our midweek meetings will begin this Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the upper hall uh, for a time of prayer for our world and our land. We encourage you to meet with us in person for that, and that's Wednesday night of this incoming week at 8 o'clock in the upper hall. And then also Kirk Session have agreed that our evening services will recommence next month, the month of October, beginning with the third Sunday night of that month being our harvest evening services and then thereafter reverting to our normal evening service uh, pattern of the first and third Sunday nights. Uh, again, we commend to you the work of our Sunday school which began this morning and we want to continue to remember the team there in our prayers and thoughts at this time. Uh, we hope to, to, to do it, that they'll leave immediately after the children's talk in church, and we'll try and ensure that that talk is towards the beginning of the service to give them time for, the, for what they'll want to go through in the program in Sunday school. And then also I would encourage you to continue to use the online booking system for our church services, uh, or if that's not possible, to contact the manse or, or some of us to let us know that you intend to be out at church. Uh, if you do forget... We're able to take your name at the door. That uh, is not a problem, but I know that it would greatly help our stewards if you could do that in advance. It saves them having to, to try and write everybody's name down as people arrive. Uh, please, if you can, use the booking system and that will reduce time at the doors for taking names, etc. I think these are all of the announcements. Again, leaders of organisations who hope to begin soon will be coordinating that with our session and we appreciate their help and their patience, and do keep all our organisational leaders in your thoughts and prayers. They need our encouragement on our prayers at this time, and please do that. Com committee meeting, sorry, exactly, yeah, well done, Alan, thank you for rescue there. Should have had that down, and I had somewhere, I don't know why I missed it out, but the committee will be meeting on Tuesday night, uh, this incoming week, at the usual time of 7.30. The items for the agenda to be with our secretary, Maud, I suppose maybe Maud, you'd like those tomorrow, if that was possible, to help you get the agenda together and then we'll meet in person on Tuesday night in the upper hall at 7.30. I think these are all of the announcements. We're going to close them with the benediction. And now may the grace of our loving Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and even forevermore. Amen.